Hello everyone and welcome. It's Q again. Welcome to the YouTube's simplest, most poorly produced, unscripted, rarely edited Amiga software channel. Yes, yeah, sometimes I do review hardware or I just ramble and talk about things, but one of the things I do and I haven't done in a while is try to help you guys learn some Amiga software that you might find joy and fun in. And one of those is Lightwave. So this is a, another video in my continuing series of Lightwave Basic. And this is where I try to teach you the, I don't know, I guess I try to teach you how to use Lightwave 3D on the Amiga like you've never seen software like this before. So I try to speak very clearly. I try to use simple terms and I probably spend way too much time explaining or trying to use, uh, I don't know, I was really bad at uh, English class, um, metaphors or alliterations or comparisons. You know, I try to explain things in a way that makes sense. So if I just say like, yeah, you know, you just got to activate your E and, and, and adjust the envelope value and make sure you shut the, uh, you know, put the, uh, the, the shift key fluid to the maximum percentage. You know, if I did all that, you would just look at me and be like, I, I don't understand what you're saying. So in this video, you know, hopefully you've checked out the other videos. I've got, um, I think four or five. This one I'm going to cover um, a couple things. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, just a warning. Uh, one, as always, when I make these videos, I've probably had something to drink, adult beverage wise. But two, these videos are long. So as you look at the other lightweight videos I've made, these videos tend to run kind of long. And it's just unavoidable because I'm trying to show you how to use this 3D software. In this video, we're going to cover lens flares, which is an iconic, an iconic? No, it's not an iconic. It's an iconic uh, feature way back when. And remember, guys, as I always say in these videos, you need to set your brains 30 years ago. Go back in time. Go way, way, way back. It's 30 years ago. You've turned on your Amiga 1200 and you've installed this software and you're like, whoa. Lens flares was a thing that just blew people's minds uh, that computer software could do that because in our mind, a lens flare is an artifact of light entering a camera lens at a certain angle and causing a flare out or a blowout. The old timers call them uh, sun dogs. Uh, later on, we just call them flares, lens flares. Um, when JJ Abrams started using them, everyone just called it you know, the JJ flare or just JJ the, the hell out of that shot and you know that kind of thing. Um, if you ever, if you saw the 2000, was it 2008 Star Trek movie that he did? Yeah, it's like full of lens flares. The future is bright. So lens flares, yes, this was an effect that was like, it was like, how could a computer do this? How is a computer 30 years ago able to calculate light bending and reflecting and reflecting into a camera lens to generate a lens flare. I mean, that just seems absurd for computer technology 30 years ago. Uh, the, 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 well, the, the trick was, and this is the trick that Lightwave did. There you go. Look, lens flare. The trick that Lightwave did back then was this isn't some fancy math that, that is doing that, that's shooting rays, shooting light into a, a virtual computer lens and, and generating this. It's an image. There's like a bunch of bitmaps, almost like sprites stored in Lightwave. And it does use some math to figure out, you know, how near or far the image is from the camera lens, where it's at, you know, whether or not it's going off screen or not, those things. And you have some control over it. But essentially what you're doing is manipulating a 2D image. Now, you might ask, of course, oh, cool, can I replace this 2D, those 2D images with my own? Uh, no, they're, they're kind of tucked away in the code. And as far as I know, you've never had access to them, so access to them, so you just need to use what they have. But what was great about this is that, of course, it saved tons of tons of computational time, um, not having to like try and generate accurate glows and flares. It just used images. So that's the cool trick with this. And this is why we had lens flares 30 years ago, and you saw them in all over the place: Babylon 5, Sequest, um, Space Above and Beyond. I mean, all those original shows that kicked off the golden era of visual effects and television. You saw these flares everywhere. In fact, uh, um, the United Artists movie logo for years used a bunch of bouncing light wave lens flares for their main movie logo. Um, Goldeneye, the movie, the James Bond movie, notoriously apparently used uh, light wave lens flares to do the big Goldeneye effect. So this, this goes way back. 
And what we're doing here is we, we start off with our light wave scene and you have your default light that's always here. And in this case, you go to the lights button here and it just says light. And it's a, actually the default light will be a distant light, I'm sorry. I change it to a point light. And this is because a point light emits light 360 degrees. That's why they call it a point. It's like a light bulb. So you're going you're gonna to be able to see a lens flare from this light no matter where the camera is looking at it because it's 360 degrees of light, right? So you go over here and you turn on the lens flare option, click, click, and then you get this panel and you get the intensity. This is how bright you're going to make the flare. A lot of this is very self-explanatory, like fade off screen. Well, what this means is that, and pretend my little pointer here is a lens flare. As the lens flare slowly makes its way off screen, it's going to fade. And when it gets to the edge here, way over here, it'll be faded 100%. So you'll get it faded off nice and gradually. If you don't do this, the flare will stay 100% bright, maximum brightness. And then as soon as it gets here, as soon as the center of that flare image gets here to the edge of the screen, it's just going to turn off. Now, you may want that. It's, it's a stylistic effect. You may want to do that. And that's what that does. Fade behind objects is a cool trick where if you move the lens flare, you know, the light behind another item in the scene, it will fade behind it, much like the, it will fade off the screen when it gets near the end here. When it, when it, when it, basically when the light gets to an object, the light will be like, hey, I'm a lens flare. And as I move behind this other object, I'm going to fade away and you can't see me, which of course is what you may want. That's why it's there. It's a button, you can turn it on and off. Uh, fade and fog means that if the little lens flare is, you know, here and you've turned on fog, which is something we haven't actually covered yet, fog, does exactly what you think it does. It simulates uh, like, you know, density in the air, fog density. So as things get further away, they get more and more transparent. Um, you can see them less, right? Um, and that's what that does. And so this will make that little flare get more and more small and faded and it'll eventually just disappear into the background, into the fog. Fade with distance is a way to make the lens flare do pretty much the same thing it does in fade and fog without having fog on. So you might ask, well, wait a minute, what if I want to have my lens flare, like let's say I have a little blinky cop car light, right? And as the cop car gets, as the cop car drives away from the camera lens, I don't want it to be the same size it was here, right? I want it to be nice and tiny, way down here. That's what the fade with distance option does. And they use a word here called nominal distance. This is very technical, nominal distance. What I call this is the, this is one of those examples in Lightwave where it's, Play with the numbers and render a frame until it works. So with this off, right now this lens flare, let's go here. If we go to the view top, you can see that the camera is here and the lens flare is here. It's really, really close to the camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually move this lens flare a little further away from the camera, okay? And then we're gonna go down here and hit create key. And remember, create key locks this in place at the frame we select. So in this case, zero. All right, and we'll go back to the camera view. So now when we hit F9 and hit render, we're gonna see our lens flare. And for those of you paying attention, you're gonna notice that, well, it, it looks exactly the same, even though I moved it. And that's because we didn't Turn on fade with distance. So we'll turn on fade with distance and we're gonna leave it at the default value of one. So we'll hit render again. By the way, all of this light waving you're seeing is being done on my Amiga 1200 with a TF1260 card running at 50 megahertz. So here you go, it's smaller. Hey, hey, look at that, it got smaller. So there's your nominal distance at the default setting. So what you can do here is you can click here and now you can type in, let's do a big number like 10. What's that gonna do? Is that gonna make it smaller or bigger? Whoa, that's gonna make it bigger. And that's because the nominal distance, so if this is the camera and this is the lens flare and the lens flare is over here, the nominal distance is like drawing out a ruler, pulling out a tape measure through the scene, okay? And saying at this distance, at, at, you know, at this distance way out here, this is where the flare is going to be its most brightest. And that's what those numbers do. So again, that sounds, you're probably like, I don't understand what you just said. This is why I call this an example of, it's one of those settings, honestly, if you're new to this, you just play with it and you figure it out. So now you know, okay, if I make this number larger, it's gonna make the lens flare brighter, even if it's further away. That's neat. And the cool thing is, is like, if this is gonna be automatic, cause you're setting these limits. 
So what will happen now is let's set it to five. Let's see what that looks like before I start talking some more. We'll set it to five. So now at, at this particular distance from the camera lens, this lens flare is going to be this size always. It's always just going to be this size. There it is. Look at that. Yay. Okay. So now you're like, well, if I move it, is it going to get smaller if I move it further away? So we'll go to the top view and we'll, we will move the light even further away. And I'm going to go to the zoom option here that I'm trying to fiddle with. Go to view and I'm going to zoom out here. I'm trying not to use hotkeys because when I use hotkeys, people get upset because they can't see what I'm doing on the keyboard. So pardon me if I have to fumble a bit here with the, uh, the controls. So we're gonna go back to light. And the reason I zoomed out is so that I can move this light further away and see where it's going. So we're gonna move it way up out here. And again, we're gonna go down here and create that keyframe again, just at zero, lock it down. You know, I keep going back to camera view. You don't have to do that. If you wanna just stay in this view, you can. We'll hit F9 because it's always gonna render from the camera view. And look at that, it got smaller. So without you having to edit any animation settings or any values, it's just getting smaller as it gets further away from the camera. That's nominal distance, that's what it's gonna do for you. And of course, if you get close to closer to the camera, it's gonna get bigger. So that's kind of a nice way to, to kind of automate lens flares in, in, your, in your shot. So if you get them on, let's say you, you, know, you set them all up in your shot and, you, and you've got them you know, in your scene and they're at a certain distance from the camera, you've turned on nominal distance and, you, and you've adjusted the values, the intensities, and you're like, okay, that's where I want them. So now when they get far away from the camera, if they get close to the camera, they're always gonna do this automatically and I don't have to worry about it. That's what that's for, that's pretty cool. Other features, flare dissolve. This is pretty much what you think it is. Whereas flare intensity controls how big and bright it's gonna get, flare dissolve just fades it away. So it's gonna be, if it's, you know, if it's this big, the flare's this big, it's gonna just fade away that big. It's not gonna get smaller to fade, it's just gonna fade away, kind of like you adjusting the opacity or the transparency on something. So all these features here, red outer glow, glow behind objects, central ring, anamorphic, okay. Central glow is the basic glowy hotspot of that lens flare. At its simplest, that's what you're gonna get. And that's what you've been seeing this whole time. If I turn on red outer glow, and hit the old render button. Now it has the, the blue lens flare that we've had this whole time, which may or not be showing up on this recording. I'm sorry. By the way, this lens flare has been blue this entire time. Now it has a red cast to it. That's the red outer glow. What these settings are simulating, red outer glow, central ring, anamorphic distortion, star filter, off-screen streaks, anamorphic streaks, random streaks, <gasps> lens reflections. These are all the simulations that I was referring to at the start of this video that is simulating what light does to a camera lens to generate these flares. This is giving you options on what you want for that flare. So you're not just stuck with like a generic, always looks the same lens flare. And you might already be thinking, this is kind of cool if I want to simulate lens flares on lights in a shot you know, in a scene I'm creating, but also this allows you, because you have the flexibility to turn these various features on and off, artists throughout the years have used lens flares as effects tools, a way to visualize interesting looking things that have nothing really to do with lights, but just look cool on their own. You get people doing, you know, blaster effects from guns or um, explosions with these, or sometimes folks use these to generate um, a series of images to then use later to displace polygons, which is basically to take an, uh, a polygon object and make it undulate and do weird things using these lens flares as an image sequence to feed that undulation. There's all kinds of options for this. It's not just lights. You don't have to just, don't box yourself in thinking, well, this is only for lights. This is an effect tool. You can use this however you want. You could make this a character. You could make this the face of your character if you wanted. He has a glowy face, that's what he does. I mean, I wouldn't, but you could do that. So all these features. So we'll go ahead and turn on central ring. And we'll turn that and I'll hit that. I'm not, I, was, I wasn't gonna go through every single feature on here because you're gonna be like, okay, I get it. So here's the central ring feature. And look at that, you get the central ring. These lens flares, by the way, some of you who are <clears throat> older may recognize them as um, kind of like the Boss Studios lens flare effects or the Dennis Murin lens flare effects. These are 
lens flares patterned off of the, the film cameras and lenses being used in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, you'll see lens flares a lot like this in Close Encounters, E.T., Blade Runner. That's what these were patterned off of, this look. And then anamorphic distortion with its control. This will actually take the lens flare and try to simulate that your camera is using an anamorphic lens, so it's gonna get squished, all right? And it just squishes, effectively, it just squishes the 2D image. It's the exact same image it's using, it's just now squished. So that if you're trying to do an anamorphic type uh, render and you want your flares to, to match that look, that's how you can achieve that effect. An anamorphic is, is, like I said, it's a type of lens you can use with a camera that produces an image with those type of visual uh, artifacts, these squished artifacts. Star filter, you have lots of cool options here you can play with, but at its simplest, this is going to add a sparkle or a farkle, depending on your background. You can already see it showing up there in the preview. Look at that, a little pretty farkle sparkle thing there. That's cool. Um, and then of course, you can adjust the rotation of this. Um, anamorphic streaks, these are again related to the anamorphic distortion. It's just another element of simulating those type of effects you get with an anamorphic lens. Uh, random streaks are the little spiky things you've been seeing on the flare the entire time. You can turn those off, and if you turn those off, you're just gonna get basically a glowy ball. Well, I left the star filter on, I'm sorry. So here's a glowy ball with star filter and the red outer ring, which I also left on, and the red outer glow. <laughs> Good job, let's turn all those off. Okay, so if you turn all these off, now you're gonna get your basic, just glowy orb. And again, if you know, if you're trying to use this as an effect for something or maybe something not related to a light, maybe this is supposed to be some kind of misty, foggy thing in the distance, you know, who, who knows? Maybe this is the moon. Those are the type of things you can do with these flares. And then, of course, lens reflections, uh, random streaks, by the way, is kind of like star filter. It just adds more spiky elements, but it's another level that you can control. Using things like random streaks with the streak intensity, how bright they are, how sharp or fuzzy they are, how many there, they, there are, you can do all sorts of crazy, cool looking things. You can create big, bright, glowy suns and supernova looking things or little tiny things. All of this here is for you to play with. And again, the best thing for you to do is what I'm doing right now. Set your camera to a resolution that renders quick and just start playing with these settings, do a render, see what it does, learn how it works. Now, lens reflections, this is a feature that simulates so um, let me do the simple version of this. So a camera has a lens, right? And in a camera lens, there are planes of glass. Okay, so light comes into the camera lens and because it's not just one piece of glass in a camera lens, there's multiple layers of glass. As that light flares and creates effects, depending on that, the angle, it's gonna bounce off each of those layers of glass in the camera lens. That's what a lens reflection is. It's basically simulating the various reflection elements that happen in a camera lens. Pretty cool effect. It's strictly, really, truly kind of a photographic effect. Um, massively overused once people discovered it, but there it is. I mean, I think it's funny that, uh, you know, directors of photography, you know, directors and lighters have spent decades trying to mitigate this, this effect in real cameras. And then CG software comes along and says, oh yeah, let's just do it. And then everyone uses it. It's kind of crazy. But that's what that feature does. And you can have fun playing with that. You know, if you, if you get out here and animate the, the light and uh, um, you know, move the light around, you'll see the lens flares will move with it and counter, counter the motion of it. So you get that kind of cool lens flare effect. You know, that's, that's what that's for. Um, one of the other features I wanted to cover, so that, you know, in a, in a really quick, simple way, that was, that was lens flares, guys. They're, that's it. At least in the Amiga version of Lightwave, that's lens flares. That's the whole shebang. So now, let's turn off, um, we'll leave random streaks on, we'll turn off lens reflections. We've got central glow. So we have a nice quality of flare. Now, to get to envelopes. So in Lightwave, you have the timeline, which is down here. So we have it set to 0 to 30. So basically... Our entire animation will be 30 frames long, and this is what's going on. Of course, there's no animation happening. So we'll go to frame 30. We're gonna move the light over here. Yep, come back light. We're gonna move it up here. And then we're gonna create a keyframe, which locks it down at frame 30. 
And so now the software, the computer software, does all the work for you. It says from frame zero and frame 30, I'm going to do all the animation for you. This is called tweening. So this goes back to the old 2D days. This is what tweening is, guys. So here it is, tweening. So now we have this little lens flare doing this. And this is, this is basic rudimentary animation in Lightwave, keyframing. A second layer of animation in Lightwave is this little E. You see these E's all over the place. Unfortunately, you don't see them in enough places. But wherever you see these little E's, like here, lens flare intensity, this is like another timeline. It's another timeline, another place for you to do animation, a secondary place for you to do, like, to do the animation. And you might ask yourself, well, why, why can't I just, like, why can't I go, you know, 24, continue, continue, frame 11, create key, you know? Why can't I do that? Doesn't that just make it 24% here? No. This animation control here is only for items that are out here. This, this, the lights, the camera, the objects that are out here. Anything that's attached to an E is its own kind of like sub animation area. And it's a graph. You can see here it says 60, okay? And over here it says zero. And it says down here, time frames. Our animation is only 30 frames long, so really our animation stops right around here. And then here's the value. So that we, when we entered, it was 24.5%. So here it is represented as 24.5%. So now you're like, okay, well, now what do I do? There's no, there's nothing I can click to like, where's, where's, where's this thing? Where's this thing where I can drag and go to the frame I want to go to? Well, you don't have that, right? So um, what you've got is when you go back to the panel, you see I'm clicking through a lot of panels. You got to, and here, by the way, when you use an envelope, it turns yellow and it lets you know here that you're using one. So what you do is um, you can hit the enter button on your Amiga keyboard and say, create a keyframe. We're gonna go ahead and say, create a keyframe at 30, because that's where our current animation ends. And lo and behold, a little, little duder shows up there. Look at that. And down here, it shows you current keyframe, 30. And if you click here, it takes you to the next keyframe, which was way back at zero. Remember, this graph goes to 60. That's just kind of its default nature right now. Um, we're only going to 30. <laughs> so there you go. And using, we're currently in drag mode. So what does this mean? So you see mouse function, right? Mouse function. Well, we just created a keyframe by clicking the enter button on your Amiga. You could also click create. This changes the mouse function. And wherever I click, it's going to create a keyframe. So now it just created a keyframe here. Where's here? Well, we have no idea because this older version of the software, of course, you don't really know what's going on at first. It just says 30. Well, we know that's not 30. 30 is over here. And what's the value? It's not 24% because we know this is 24%. When you first click, you, you're kind of doing a visual guess. So you know it's going to be close to 60. It's probably going to be close to frame 15. So what you do is you go here and you just kind of click and you go, oh, it's frame 15 and it's 56%. Okay. Now, that's one way to create keyframes. You can also delete keyframes by going to delete mouse function and very carefully clicking where it's at. And now it goes away. See, isn't that great? And then drag does what you think it would do. If you click drag when you, um, oh, well, we don't actually have anything to drag. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When you click drag, you click on the keyframe. You have, I always forget that. You got to make sure you're on it. You get the mouse pointer really close to it. And now you can drag it up and down, right? See, that's what that's for. Because down here you have a value. You can also just type in the value. Because like you're gonna be like, so you're telling me in order to, to change this value, I've got to drag it. But when I'm dragging it, the number down here isn't changing. All I have for reference is this gauge over here. That sucks. I want it to be 80%. Am I supposed to just guess that's 80%? No, you can come down here, backspace, backspace on your Amiga, type in 80, enter, and now you got 80%. And then scroll allows you to actually scroll this timeline. So as you can see over here, see how it's changing? It's always a minimum of 60 frames, but you can scroll forward to get to other keyframes. So what we've done here is we've told this lens flare at frame 30, our last frame, to be 80%, and at our first frame to be 24%. We're gonna change that to be like 0%. 
So now we have these two keyframes. So now our lens flare is going to travel across the screen and as it travels across the screen, it's going to actually turn on and get brighter. You can copy and paste keys and that's pretty much like any other program you've ever used, including Microsoft Office or Word. You just click a key, sorry, click a key. Remember, see I'm in scroll mode right now, mouse function, so I'm trying to click on this and it's not gonna work. So if I go back to drag, I can click on it. But you gotta be careful because if I click on it and then move the mouse while holding the mouse button, it's gonna, it's gonna drag it. So be careful with that. Try, try to use this down here to, to select your keys, right? So we'll go here. You can copy this key and then scroll and paste it down someplace else. You can create and delete keys right here from this, this option as well. You've got create and delete here. But remember, this is for the mouse. If you click this create and this delete, this is like you pressing delete on the Amiga keyboard. This is like you pressing enter on the Amiga keyboard to create and delete. The end behavior. So what this tells it is that once this little sub animation plays, once it gets to frame 30, what's this last keyframe gonna do? It's just gonna stop. The light's gonna go to 100%, or no, it's gonna go to 80%, and that's it, that's all that's gonna happen. But here we can say, no, we don't want you to do that. We want you to reset. And if it resets, it's just gonna go back to what it was. But if we go to repeat, it's going to continue to keep going to 80%. Um, newer versions of Lightwave have even more options, which make this a lot more fun. But repeat is a great way if we go to, uh, for example, if I take this keyframe and uh, let's go ahead and set it. So let's go to the first keyframe. We said zero, right? So let's make this keyframe zero, okay? And then let's create a new keyframe at frame 15, okay, and let's make it 100. So now we've got off, on, off. Well, I want a blinking light. I want my light to blink. Do I have to sit here and create all these frames blinking on and off, on and off, on, by hand? That's, that's gonna take a while. Now, keep in mind, this is 30 year old software. And if you had to click on these and do this by hand, honestly, that should be fully expected. I mean, this is 30 year old software. That's what you should probably have to do. But with this end behavior, we have this really powerful feature of repeat. And when you do repeat, what it's going to do is that it's gonna play through this animation, off, on, off. And then when it gets to the end, now you're not seeing it here in the graph because this 30 year old software doesn't show you that. But when it gets to the uh, end of the, the animation here, it's gonna repeat. So it's gonna go back to zero and then come back on again and turn back off again. So you're effectively gonna have a blinking lens flare over these 30 frames. Yeah, that's kind of cool. So that's, that's what this is for. And of course, these animations you can save. So if you've, if you've spent you know, hours tweaking some amazing cool animation that you've done for the whatever this E is, you can save it. And you can load and save these anywhere you see that little E button. So even if it's not a light or a lens flare, it could be a surface color, you know, the color of an actual polygon. It could be um, controlling uh, how the camera moves. I mean, you can put that anywhere you see an E. That, that value, saving this little file here. So that's really, really handy. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use the, the delete and I'm gonna click delete. I'm gonna go back to drag just to protect myself. I'm gonna make sure I'm on frame 30 and I'm gonna set that back to 100%. And I'm gonna go down here and say use. You said remove, it's gonna basically turn this off, undo everything we did and we're back to where we were. Or you can hit cancel if you clicked in here and you're like, ooh, wait, no, I screwed up. I did crazy stuff. I don't know what I'm doing. If you hit cancel, it's sort of like an undo. Like you can undo all the chaos that you didn't hear. It's kind of a, a gimme, so that's nice. But we're gonna say use envelope. So now when we come back out, like I said, if we press F9, we should see a bright little lens flare at 100%. And sure enough, there we go. We have a bright little lens flare at 100%. Look at that. Oh, it's, it's, so, it's so beautiful. Oh, look at this. So then if we go back to zero, we press the render button, we should have the darkness. And indeed we have the darkness. And if we go halfway through-ish, we should have just a little bitty tiny flare. Eh, you know, not so small, but you know, it's definitely smaller than the one we saw at the end. And there you go. So you've, you've created an animation of a light turning on as it goes up. And now you completely and totally understand envelopes and what the heck they're for and how you use them. You're like, dude, totally. 
Now I can go to the image editor and I can look, for, oh, there's no E's here. Oh, bummer. Go to the camera. I'm like, yeah, I can. Oh, oh, there's no E's here. Oh, wait, there's an E here. Blur, yeah. Blur length or depth of field, focal length. Oh, what's that? So again, those E's you can load and save Anywhere you didn't use an E, you can use an E. So if you save the file, I could I could make I could make the motion blur how blurry something is as it moves. I could use the same thing I did for that light to make something at frame zero not have any blur, which I can't do, like not have any blur. And then at frame 30, it'd be at 100 percent It'd have lots of blur. So you can do that same thing with those E's. So that's that's the E's. And that's lens flares, by the way. And gosh, you know, I just hope that made sense. And uh, this video, as always, is about 30 minutes. So that's going to do it for Lightwave Basic. That was lens flares and envelopes in the most basic way I could think of to tell you all. As always, thank you for watching. See you next time.